Chapter 7. Dr. Zimmer came out the back door. There, he said, I guess that will bring Dr. Kennedy all right. I called him up and said that if he wasn't here by noon tomorrow, I'd have to consult the paleontologist at the Museum of Natural History. I finally convinced him that I wasn't fooling, and he said he'd take a plane out of Washington as soon as he could. He walked over and sat down in the shade with us under the maple tree. Pretty soon, Cynthia brought out a tray with four glasses of lemonade, and we all sat around sipping the lemonade very slowly to make it last longer. It's nice and quiet here now, Dr. Zimmer said. I suppose we might as well enjoy it while we can. In another 24 hours or so, I suspect things are really going to be popping in freedom. And I guess I'll be very busy answering phone calls, Cynthia said. I suppose there will be some from a long way off, like Boston and Portland. That will be exciting. I like to think of those voices coming along all those miles of wire all the way from Boston. Even farther than that, I bet, I said. Maybe even from New York. Even Chicago, maybe. Oh, go on, Nate, Joe Chimpigny said. Who would ever hear about your lizard in Chicago? That's way out west in Ohio. It isn't either in Ohio, I said. It's in Michigan or someplace like that. Anyway, not in Ohio. And it's not a lizard, I said. It's a dinosaur, I tell you. Ask Dr. Zimmer. Looks like a lizard to me, Joe said. Dr. Zimmer swirled his lemonade around to stir up the sugar in the bottom of the glass. He looked over at Joe with his eyebrows up and sort of smiled to himself. It is a kind of lizard, he said. That's what the word dinosaur means, a terrible lizard. But how come a dinosaur would come out of a hen's egg? Joe wanted to know. That doesn't make sense. Dr. Zimmer shrugged his shoulders. You've got me there, he said. That's the queer thing about this. Of course, nature does play tricks every now and then. Sometimes a calf is born with three legs, or a chicken hatches out with webbed feet like a duck's. Sometimes an animal will inherit something from an ancestor way back along the family tree somewhere. If I had red hair, for instance, and no one else in my family had it, everyone would wonder where the red hair came from, and then they would find out that my great-great-grandmother had red hair, and I inherited it from her. Do you see that? We all nodded. Well, the doctor said, if you go back far enough, and I mean millions of years, you'll find that birds and reptiles are related to each other. That's why they are alike in some ways. How is a chicken like a turtle, for example? A chicken like a turtle? I, I, I looked at Joe and he looked it back at me. Neither of us could think of anything. They both lay eggs, Cynthia said. Well, Joe and I felt pretty silly about that. How did my sister even think of that? I didn't know that she'd ever even looked at a turtle. I guess girls notice things more than you think. That's right, said Dr. Zimmer. They both lay eggs. Joe looked up suddenly. A turtle's got a scaly kind of skin, and chickens are sort of scaly on their legs. Good for you, Joe, the doctor said. And neither of them have teeth, I said. Dr. Zimmer nodded. So you see, he said, Birds are like reptiles in some ways, and dinosaurs are reptiles. What must have happened here is that things got a bit mixed up, and when the egg hatched out, it turned out to be another branch of the family. That isn't a very scientific explanation, but I'm rather puzzled by this myself. It's a very peculiar thing. Joe Chapigny looked at him for a while. But I thought you were a scientist, he said. Scientists are supposed to know all the answers, aren't they, like teachers? Dr. Zimmer smiled and shook his head. No, Joe, a scientist doesn't know all the answers. Nobody does, not even teachers. But a scientist keeps on trying to find the answers. He stood up and dusted off the knees of his pants. Well, I guess I ought to go back to the McPhersons. They'll be wondering what has happened to me. Nate, you probably should give your dinosaur another meal of grass sometime later today. I'll be over in the morning in time to greet Dr. Kennedy when he gets here. I went out to feed the chickens before supper. On the way, I got a big armful of grass and put it in the dinosaur's pen. He came waddling out of the box and started right in on the grass. 
he was still going strong when mom called me in for supper. Have you given your animal a name, Nate? Pop wanted to know. Not yet, I said. Got any suggestions? Well, I don't know, Pop says slowly. I've sacrificed most of my best family names to the livestock by now. Perhaps there's a good name on your mother's side of the family. Seems to me there was... Now, what was his name? It was your great uncle, wasn't it? Oh, Mom said. You must be thinking of great uncle John Beasley. That's it, Pop said. You could shorten it to Uncle Beasley. I should think... And come to think of it, if I recollect his picture, there is a certain resemblance between the two. Walter, Mom said. Great Uncle Beasley was a very good man. He just got a bit crotchety along toward the end. I don't think he should say anything disrespectful of him. Why not at all, Pop said. It really is more of an honor. It may be that the name of Uncle Beasley will go down in history if we name this young dinosaur after him. Mmph, Mom said with a little smile. Uncle Beasley, Uncle Beasley, Uncle Beasley, I said, sort of trying it out. Cynthia giggled. All right, I said, it sounds pretty good after you get used to it. I guess I'll take it if, it, if Mom doesn't mind. After supper, I went out to see how things were. The grass was all gone, every bit of it, and the little fellow was lying down in his box. I could just see him there in the dark. I really had gotten to like him a lot already. Good night, Uncle Beasley, I said, and went back into the house.